Testing, testing. Great, thanks. We have today a lecture on ideal transformers. And I have here the whole presentation. So I will go to the part number three that we we have to do it today. So it's uh, from current slide here. Hello, everyone. Today we have our lecture number three on ideal transformers. Ideal transformers are a way that we have to model transformers in a more, how to say, simple way. We have some equivalent models and we do not consider the construction of the transformers that we really have our winding for the primary <clears throat> and a winding for the secondary. So they are made of copper, they have losses. Your transformer has a core, is a magnetic iron and that has losses. Uh, so in an ideal transformer, we do not have core losses, we do not have copper losses, we do not have any leakage or capacitive effects. So <clears throat> the ideal transformer is a simple way to incorporate in our circuits and eventually can use KVL and KCL. So today we have a review <clears throat> of what we have been learning on in the last uh, lecture, lecture number two. Then quickly we discuss uh, three-phase transformers and I have some problems that I solved for you. So review, uh, when you have a transformer model, you have to pay attention. Uh, how is the formulation that you have? You may have a formulation that's typically done when you take uh, courses in physics where you have inductance with self-value, self-inductance, and a mutual effect, okay? So if you have a problem that has a circuit similar to this on the top or this on the bottom, we have to write the KVL and KCL by considering the mutual effect. So what you have to do is you pay attention to the dots, look dot, 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 non dot, dots here. Current I1, the primary, enters the dot, see? Current I2 enters the dot. So because current I2 enters the dot and current I1 enters the dot, the mutual effect will be positive, okay? Now let's see here current I1 enters a dot. Current I2 enters no dot or leaves the dot, see? So they are reversed on this, <clears throat> on this polarity. So your mutual effect is minus. When you write your KVL, you do along the mesh. So you write your voltage drops in our voltage source. Then you do your self-inductance. And then you consider if your mutual is positive or negative, okay? So that's the right way to assign the right polarity for the mutual voltage effect. An ideal transformer means that we do not have any core loss, no copper loss. And the inductance you have, they only play energy conversion. And eventually the relationships will just become <clears throat> algebraic ones. Algebraic ones because you do not have any dynamics. They are equations of multiplication division. So the primary voltage is V1, the primary, the secondary voltage is V2. 
number of turns in the primary, number of turns in the secondary. So you see that there is a direct relationship here for voltage. And there is an inverse relationship for current. So this box here reflects voltage and current relationships on the primary and the secondary in respect to the turns ratio. The next box means that the, the power in your primary should be the same as the power in a secondary because the transformer does not have any loss. <clears throat> so how the power from the primary is converted into the secondary without any loss. Because we have AC voltage, typically we use RMS values but we're not discussing this in this particular section of the course. This would be important when you discuss power circuits. But you could consider that the RMS of the voltage multiplied by the RMS of the current on the primary should be the same as the RMS of the voltage multiplied by the RMS of the current on the secondary. Because when you have AC, you either do RMS or if you multiply instantaneous values, they also conserve, but we have to evaluate uh, using time domain techniques. Then we can define impedance on the primary, impedance on the secondary, and by using this uh, formulation here of the turns ratio square, we come to the conclusion that the impedance on the primary divided by the impedance on the secondary is equal to the turns ratio, primary to the secondary square. So this equation should also be used together with the first box and the second box because all of them are relationship, algebraic relationships that define the ideal transformer um, relationship, the energy conversion. Then we also discussed last class that we could have an equivalent model that we call a T model, also called Y model. Why? Because a T, if you just take those two branches of the T and make a little diagonal, you have a Y. So it's either T or Y. And then we also have a model called pi because we have two branches and another one, two inductance, and they are similar to a delta, okay? Uh, most of the time we do not use the delta connection and most of the time we use the T equivalent model because it becomes very easy to write KVL and KCL. So we're starting from your uh, mutual effect equations you have to go back to, to to the previous lecture and see how this was defined. We come to this T equivalent model where now I have three different inductance, okay? And they are defined in terms of the previous parameters. First one, start from the first one. The mutual effect, it's exactly the value of this inductance here from the, from the node, from this node to the ground, okay? Then I have another inductance here, another inductance there. They would be the difference, the subtraction of your self inductance, L1 minus the mutual. And here is L2 minus the mutual. So because we don't have a negative inductance in this model, it's clear that your self inductance should be greater than the mutual and it always is okay so l1 is always a value that's uh, bigger or greater than m so uh, here i have lx which is self-inductance minus mutual and here is ly which is self-inductance l2 minus mutual and here is mutual and then you have this uh, equivalent model and what's nice is how those inductors are self. 
there is no mutual. I have a mutual effect on this equivalent model on A, but on this equivalent model on B, which is the T equivalent model, all the inductance are self. There is no mutual because the mutual is incorporated in the model. So that means you can use a circuit simulator for that. You can use a P spice, you can use multi scene, you can use a Scenescape uh, electrical power systems in MATLAB. You just write, uh, you just draw your circuit using these parameters for the T model, and you do not have to be concerned about mutual effect. Okay. The one on the top would be a little more difficult to model in, in, in a circuit simulator, unless the circuit simulator also has a uh, mutual effect, okay? But the most indicated one is the T equivalent model. And the T equivalent model has those equations of voltage and current, and um, uh, they are, uh, you have to remember that the transformer is the same, okay? So eventually your V1 and I1 and V2 and I2, they have the same solutions. However, you can express in this way or in another way. I am not doing here the pi equivalent model, just T equivalent model. And here we have a problem that uh, shows how we can apply. I have a circuit with mutual effect, okay? I could write equations for this, but then I decided, of course, the book decided that uh, we want to have a T model. So we have here a T model. You see that your mutual comes exactly here from this node to the ground. Okay, let's call this ground or reference node. And here I have a value which is the self minus the mutual. Let's see, J5 minus J2 is J3, okay? And on this side, I have J20 minus J2 is J18. So here it's the self from that model minus the mutual. When you have your equivalent circuit uh, as a T model, you don't you do need to worry about any mutual positive or negative anything. You just do your KVL or KCL, write your equations, and then you have a matrix, you invert the matrix, and you have a solution. And in our book, this is example 8.32, uh, it shows that uh, the same solution was done in another methodology before. You have to look on the book, but here is just an illustration how to use the T model. Another, uh, another important uh, discussion for transformer. I have a transformer here, primary side, secondary side, turns ratio. Maybe I would like to imagine that there is a boundary here. See, look, boundary, 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 A, B, okay? And everything on the right, will be replaced by a model. See, I have Vs and Z1. So what I have is everything on the secondary is reflected to the primary. So that's what's happening here. This is the reflection. I have a reflection of the impedance and I have a re reflection of the voltage on the secondary. You can use the Thevenin equivalent uh, as uh, a model uh, equivalent to the connections A and B, which is the primary side. But maybe instead, I would like to take the whole thing on the primary and reflect here on the secondary. So you just look CD, boundary, 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 boundary. So everything on the left of the boundary will be replaced by this model. So that means the primary side is reflect on the secondary. So that means across C and D, I have a Thevenin equivalent to the terminal C and D. And this is the reflection. This is the turns ratio. This, there is a reflection of the impedance. There is a reflection of the voltage. That's the review so far 
on ideal transformers and pretty much the last five minutes eight minutes it has all the algebraic equations and models and anything you need to use uh, in solving an ideal transformer. This is what I love to discuss, power systems. It's my expertise, power electronics and power systems. So I would love to discuss a whole course with you, but we only have a few minutes to show you why it's important to have transformers in a typical power grid. We have, um, let's say, here they say a nuclear power station, but could be any power station. Could be a fossil fuel power station, hydropower power station. But what you have is a turbine. The turbine is uh, generate, uh, moving a machine. The machine gives you a certain voltage and the voltage will be three phase and i have a primary substation what's a primary substation it's a transformer substation is a big transformer and then we increase the voltage and then we transmit we have transmission lines and eventually are going to have some dis distribution for factories uh, we may step down the voltage for another substation that we have a distribution for Places like, uh, let's say in Golden, you have Colorado Scoff Mines, you have Coors, you have National Renewable Energy Lab. Those would be large customers. But we also have uh, apartment buildings, residence, office. So we may have um, uh, distribution lines that are on the order of 4,800 volts. And then we have transformers, typically on the pole, you look to a transform on the pole and then you step down. When you step down, you have your 120 volts or 240 volts AC 60 Hertz available for you. So we have transformers everywhere. The way that they generate will, will generate three phase. We have an electrical machine and we may have magnets. We can have a synchronous generator with permanent magnets. We can have a synchronous generator with electromagnets instead of uh, permanent magnets, but pretty much uh, uh, electrical energy conversion with uh, rotating machines. You have a, a magnetic flux, that magnetic flux is rotating, and that man magnetic flux is interacting with other stationary windings. So this interaction of uh, rotating magnetic flux with windings that are stationary and located in a distribution on the perimeter of a cylinder, which is the machine. So here we have three phase and eventually we're gonna have phase V1, V2 and V3. So we have a three phase voltage, you see the lines here. There is a blue and a green and a red. You see that they are phase shift uh, if you look, you can come from here and look over here. Uh, you can see if V1 is a cosine, see? V1 is a cosine, starts here. V2 is uh, lagging. So it's lagging by how much? V2, it starts when V1 is at this uh, degrees here, phase shift. So V2 is lagging by 120 degrees. V3 is lagging by further 120, so 240 degrees from the previous one. So we have uh, three phase uh, voltage, 360 degrees, which is two pi divided by three, will give you a distribution of the windings uh, ever 120 degrees. So we have a spatial phase shift of windings with a time domain phase shift of voltage excitation that gives me a three phase balanced power. We can express each one, V1 and V2 and V3 as phasor. So V1 here is phasor for voltage one. So there is a magnitude, phase zero. Then another one is another the same magnitude, phase 120 degrees. And then there is another one here 
that could be phase 240. So this could be plus 240, but it's the same as minus 120 degrees. So that's the way that we discuss and describe a three-phase AC system. How the transformers will be connected in a three-phase system? We we can have uh, independent transformers, single phase transformers connected in a way that will serve as a overall three phase system. A three phase system will be like three voltage source with a neutral. So this would be the Y connection, or maybe they would be connected in a path like this, in a continuous path. So this is the Delta configuration. We may have a transformer for connection in Y or a transformer for a connection in Delta. And here we can see that we have transformers. You see, that's one transformer. This is another transformer. This is another transformer. So you can see that we have three single phase transformers, but they are connected in a way that here we have a Y connection, okay? And then we have A, B, and C for the output of this transform. If you want to do in delta connection, you see here that here you have transformer, transformer, transformer. So you just connect then in a continuous connection like this, and eventually have a delta connection. You may have a connection of transformers that uh, uh, converts Y into delta. So you see here that we have transformers that here we have a Y connection and then they are connecting Delta. So this is a Y to Delta transformer. We also have Delta to Y transformer. We may have a connection of transformers in series in parallel to increase voltage, to increase current, to compensate for harmonics. So this is a very typical and important topic discussed in power systems. If you are interested in this area, I would recommend you to take a class initially in electrical machines and energy conversion in the electrical engineer department. There is a course like that. You can have a lab, but I believe the lab uh, is only for double E students. Uh, maybe you can have a, a double major if you want. And after you, you learn the basics of machinery and transformers and energy conversion, you can take classes in power systems and power electronics. So that would be a typical path towards learning electrical energy and power. Let's see, problem number one. <laughs> last, last class, I introduced you to the problems. I ask you to solve. I don't know if you did, but anyway, I will discuss the problems one by one. Problem number one, suppose you have a 25 load resistance and that 25 load resistance should appear as a 100 ohms resistance to a source, okay? Suppose the source is an AC voltage source. So what's your solution? Uh, the solution that we should think here is to use a transformer. If the voltage source has an internal resistance, uh, what is the value of such internal resistance that allows you to have the maximum power transfer? That's the same discussion of the equivalent Thevenin. So the solution is here. A load can be reflected to the primary side of transformer when the voltage source is AC. I have an AC voltage source. I have here a uh, a box indicating my AC voltage source with internal resistance RG, so VG and RG, sinusoidal voltage, resistance. So I'm not assuming any inductance here, any capacitance. Otherwise, I have to discuss a little more about the complex conjugates. Everything is a real value, okay? So I have a transformer connect to the 25 ohms. So Z1 divided by Z2, should be equal to N1 divided by N2 squared. That's the relationship I have here, okay? So Z1 divided by Z2 is N1 divided by N2 squared. Well, that's the one I want to find. So I will take the square root of Z1 and Z2. 
So should appear as a hundred here, 25. So a hundred is Z1, 25 is Z2. A hundred divided by 25 is four. Square root of four is two. That means N1 divided by N2 should be two. That means I have to have twice as number of turns on the primary than on the secondary. That means from the primary to the secondary, I should step down the voltage with turns ratio n1 divided by n2 is equal to if i do that my 25 ohms is reflected to the primary side as 100 ohms and in order to have maximum power transference here the internal resistance you can consider this like an equivalent tevenant should be the same as the load so rg should be 100 ohms in order to have maximum power transference. So that's problem number one. Let's see problem number two. Problem number two, I have two transformers and a load. I want to find ZAB. Okay, let's see. The first transformer takes a voltage and because the turns ratio is eight to one, I will step down, isn't it? And then the second one is also 10 to 1. So I step down again. Because there is no losses, I could make the assumption that this transformer has an equivalent turns ratio. Okay, so the discussion is here. Two transformers in series like this will make uh, the equivalent turns ratio to be the first one multiplied by the second one, that's 80. So if you have just one transformer, N1 divided by N2 equals 80, will be the same. Then I apply the idea of the impedance reflection. Z1 divided by Z2 is equal to N1 divided by N2 squared, that's 80 squared, okay? So that means Z1, which is the reflection on the primary, is Z2, okay? Z2 is 80 phase 60 degrees. That's what's said here, Z load, okay? 80, 60 degrees multiplied by 80 square. Well, 80 square multiplied by 80 is eight cube. Uh, you don't, you keep the phase shift because uh, there is no, there is no change on the phase shift. So 80 squared is eight multiplied by eight multiplied by eight. That means ZAB, which is the question on this problem, is 80 squared, which is 512,000 ohms phase 60 degrees. So that's the solution for problem number two. Problem number three, uh, we did a similar one already in last class. Take a look, there was a similar exercise. But here we have um, more components, that's all. So if the phasor voltage is 25,000 volts, zero degrees, 25 kV, okay? So I have here circuit, they are already in the phasor domain, see J here, minus J there. So what I can do is I can look as an equivalent model where I see 1,500, J6,000, that's the voltage on the primary, voltage on the secondary. The only thing is that I am using a formulation here as a voltage source, just to indicate V1 and V2. So I remove the transformer and I write the relationships for the ideal transformer. Then I define a mesh for circuit on the left, a mesh for the circuit on the right. Then for mesh number one, I have these equations. For mesh number two, I have those equations. Now I, I go to my ideal transformer equations. I have V1 is for V2 as 25, which is equal to I2 divided by I1. So what I'm gonna do, I will substitute V2 and I2 to have V1 and I1. So that's what I do here, see? I2 is 25 I1, that comes here. V2 is one divided by 25 V1, that comes here. 
I make the substitution here, then I only have V1 and I1. When I do that, the first equation is the same here. So what I did was I1 multiplied by this impedance plus V1 equals to Vg on the right-hand side. Mesh number two, I make a substitution here. So I have I1, see, I1. I have four multiplied by 25 minus J14 multiplied by 25, it's here. And V2 is V1, see, V1 divided by 25. When you do that, you have a matrix formulation, see? This matrix here multiplied by I1 on V1 equals to, this is not 25, it's 25 KV, okay? So it's missing here, 25, 10 into three. Uh, I already scanned, so, but this 25, 10 into three is 25 KV, and this is zero. So I have to take this matrix and invert. You can invert by hand if you want. There is a way to take a two by two matrix and invert by hand. You have a lot of algebraic uh, steps for that. What I did, I went to MATLAB. I typed these coefficients here inside of a matrix. I inverted. And this is the solution given by MATLAB. So the matrix here is the inverse of that matrix. That means I1 and V1 is equal to the inverse of that matrix multiplied by that vector. So you can only span this and then you can find phase I1, phase V1. You should eventually do all the algebraic steps to have I1 in V1 as a polar form, that means a magnitude and phase, because from the polar form, you can write down the time domain equation because the polar form, you just take the magnitude, multiply by cosine of omega t and the phase shift, okay? So that's the problem number three. And that's the end of this class. I will stop the recording.